was I thought that would be bridging. Maybe I misunderstood what bridging was. I thought bridging Bridge. was making the base router a pass through that would just, you know Just don't have Eero do the NAT, I think is what yeah. Roger was saying. Yeah. And, oh, then, and then I you're thought fine. you were saying have Eero do the NAT and not the base router. No, you, 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 don't, don't, you can let the router do the NAT. Yeah, you'd have to know what I was saying is in the Eero, you want to set it to... Yeah, and Eero's setup to... software will take all of this out of your hands. It'll say like, oh, we see you have a router. Great. We're going to set this all up. Oh, I mean, okay. you have control of changing it if you want, but it'll just, it has a wizard. All right. Some research is needed. If you want the uh, the first half of this entree, l'entree of a conversation... <laughs> uh, uh, you have to get it uh, from the Patreon version of the show. Uh, mm -hmm. nope. Now we move on to Le Plat Principal. <laughs> you amaze me every Tuesday. <laughs> That's because today's lesson was Le Désert, <laughs> Le Plat <laughs> Principal, La I need, I need the Le Control. Le Control, <laughs> pour le Roger. 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 Roger, Roger. Ah, yes, a I have a thesaurus. J'aimerais. Sounding name. <sighs> J'aimerais start the show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, je suis né prêt. <laughs> Por qué? Pourquoi? Pourquoi? <laughs> je suis né prêt. Uh, uh, I was born ready, is what I'm saying. Oh, nay. I thought you were saying, nah, sorry. Yes. No. I thought you were saying, I'm not ready. Yes. No. You were born ready, of course, because yes. nay, not yeah, nah. Obviously, clearly. I need to get that E as an A from Spanish out of my head. Mm -hmm. All right. It'll happen, though. Es que tu pay? Where am I? Okay. Here we... I was about to ask you again in English, but I'm like, why? We already know. Really? Here we go. The Daily Tech News Show is powered by you. To find out more, head to dailytechnewsshow.com slash support. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, August 15th, 2017. I'm Tom Merritt, along with Patrick Beja. How are you, sir? I am excellent, as usual. Always excellent. Ah, that's so good. So nice. That's what the clean country living does for you. <laughs> Absolutely. I am actually uh, in the countryside right now, as illustrated by the bookshelf behind me. That's the countryside uh, decor. Yeah, because Patrick retreats into the country to read and think. <laughs> and, yeah. Yes, exactly. Let's go with that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, Roger Chang, our producer, is alongside as well. Uh, thank Hello. you, Roger. Good to have you along. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Not just Roger, but everybody. Qualcomm is adding depth sensing and biometric authentication, so things like facial recognition, to its Qualcomm Spectra module program for manufacturers of Android phones. The Spectra system lets manufacturers swap out camera functions during manufacturing, giving them some, some good options to add in functions to their builds, mostly taking advantage of dual camera sensors. Excellent. Researchers have published a study showing that using a smiley face in a normal workplace email decreases the perception of competence and undermines information sharing. And reading this, I do a little bit of a face palm and uh, realize that I've been undermining myself. <laughs> Winky face. Yeah. Man, exactly. imagine, what, imagine what the poop emoji does to your formal <laughs> workplace communication. Just saying. <laughs> Uh, hey, Blizzard's not getting rid of Battle.net after all. Uh, the company announced it has decided to just add the name Blizzard to the Battle.net logo. And when referring to Battle.net in print, they'll always call it Blizzard Battle.net. So compromise solution. Yeah, no. But so they announced they were going to get rid of Battle.net, calling it the Blizzard service. But Battle.net was still going to be the technology that would uh, power it all under, under the, the uh, what's the expression? Under the radar, behind yes, the yes, 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 exactly. Behind the curtain. Behind the curtain. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, producer Roger. Uh, and now they're calling it Blizzard Battle.net. It's a mouthful. I think everyone's gonna be calling it Battle.net. Yeah. Although they're gonna leave the uh, the launcher, which used to be called the Battle.net launcher, is gonna stay the Blizzard launcher. 
It's just the networking that they're going to keep calling Battle.net. Here's some more top stories. Threat Post reports a wireless update to LockState's 6000i model of smart locks bricked the devices, leaving them unable to be locked without a key. And some people didn't have keys. They were relying only on the app. Customers were instructed to return the locks for repair or replacement. The update was meant for the 7000 I models, not the 6000 I models, but they sent it to the wrong model and it caused the locks to fail to reconnect to the web service and once they couldn't reconnect. I mean, I don't know that this is what happened, but imagine a firmware update that changes the URL of the web service and then suddenly once the firmware is in place it's like i'm looking but i can't find any web service uh, approximately 200 airbnb customers were affected by this due to a partnership between airbnb and lockstate that's the nightmare scenario is not it because you're like well you just return it wait it's your lock you have yeah. to like I'm, I'm guessing they're uh very well attached to the doors that they're locking uh, it can't be an, a, a fun experience for the people that use it. And that would be the situation where you wouldn't have a key, right? The owner yeah. of the place that, that they're renting it on Airbnb might have a key, but they're like, oh, you just, we'll just authorize you in this app. Just download this mm -hmm. app and you're fine, right? Until you're We're not We're living fine. in the future and everyone who says the future sucks is validated now. <laughs> I mean, uh, I hesitate to get too it's, upset at Lockstate no, for this because course. they're doing the right thing that a lot of these Internet of Things companies don't do, which is trying to update the firmware on a regular basis. And that's exactly why it's so bad, because they are doing the right thing. They just made a mistake, and mistakes happen. And in the grand scheme of things, this is a minor inconvenience, you know, overall. But it's still an inconvenience that's got to be visible to a lot of to the people who experience it. Yeah. Um, that's why and, I'm and, saying it's the scenario. And, and don't forget, like, the, the my, my example of how this might happen isn't what happened. Because I see people in the chat room who are like, well, here's what you would do to fix that. Uh, I'm, I'm sure there's a reason why you can't fix it over the air anymore. Uh, and you have to bring it in. Right. They can't just go in and put on that URL that the thing is actually accessing. It's probably not what happened. Uh, U.S. District Judge Edward Chen granted a pre preliminary injunction Monday telling LinkedIn it could not block a startup called HiQ Labs from accessing public LinkedIn information. HiQ scrapes public data to feed algorithms that try to predict employee behavior like quitting a job. LinkedIn will uh, continue to fight the case. Which side would you like to take on this one? Because uh, I'll, I'll take whichever <laughs> one you don't. I see. I can um, see it this both ways. Listen, this is public information. It's not locked behind a, a login or a paywall or anything. They're using public information and they are using it for whatever they are using it for. It's still public. Yes. It, you know, it's, it's, I don't know that LinkedIn even owns that information. They, they, they're not doing anything that someone couldn't do with a piece of paper and a pen and looking at those pages. Yeah, so, and Netflix videos are public, right? Uh, YouTube videos are public, so I should be able to just scrape all of them and redistribute them myself, right? Well, Netflix are behind a paywall. YouTube, I think that might be... A, That's why a, I switched a, to YouTube, because right. I realized, <laughs> mm, yeah, Netflix not the best example. Well, I mean, it, there's a difference between uh, scraping it and repackaging it and, and using it for profit somewhere else. It's and a copy, right, in those cases. Making the copy is what causes the problem, not just the redistribution. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. But they're not using, I mean, they're using it for research and transforming the data uh, into something else. Sure. You, maybe there is a fair use that you're describing here, uh, but LinkedIn is is not is not saying this is this is public domain information. They're actually not even uh, they're not they're not even asserting a copyright. What LinkedIn's doing is saying, hey, this is on our website, and there are terms of use for using our website, and you're violating the terms of use of using our website. They don't have an account though. They're just they're just you know using uh, the website doesn't require an account. Mm. Do you? Oh, I guess so. Do you have to abide by the terms of use to read what's printed on that page? Printed, quote unquote. Uh, yes, you do. 
All right. Fair enough. <laughs> listen, um, listen, I told you I could take either side of this and you made me take the side I, I agree with less. Uh, I am more, I have, I this would, is, this is harder I, I for would, me to keep doing it because I am with you that if it's public information, you have to expect I'm that people are going to use that, that side, information. Like yeah. I'm not even necessarily on that side. I would, however, give the example of Switch. remixing, uh, remixing, uh, uh, music, you sampling things and remixing it, which is largely authorized if it doesn't go beyond a certain threshold. Another um, another objection that LinkedIn might raise is, you know, this this was an undue burden. This is an unanticipated use of its server load. And if they're letting everyone go scrape them, then they're going to spend all their bandwidth and server load on scrapers rather than people who actually want to use LinkedIn. Uh, well, I, I think I think that's probably going to be exaggerating the case, but but that that is the other argument uh, here. Yeah, it and does hold argument. water. It does hold water. I think another very big argument that they're not going to be talking about is if HiQ can start predicting, do you know that kind of analysis and start predicting when employees using the service are you know try, going to quit their job or look for another job or these kinds of things can be very embarrassing for the employees, for the employers. And I think that's the most frightening oh, thing. Even I actually, I'll take it right? a step further. I think LinkedIn's got their own version of this that they want to <laughs> sell to LinkedIn clients. And if some other company is doing it with mm. information they can get in public for free, LinkedIn would like to stop them from doing that. However, Judge Edward Chen says, no, you can't block them from doing this. It's If you're putting it out on the web, you have to expect people to use it. And you can't put conditions on how they use it unless you're asserting a copyright, which LinkedIn is not doing, even though I used that as an example earlier. And, uh, and I will say, before we move on, uh, with, it's actually probably the most interesting thing about this. If this holds, it has implications for many other services other than LinkedIn, which could be, you know, which could make a lot of web giants yeah not happy at all. No, this is precedent setting either way. Uh, it could change what companies are willing to allow to be made public, even for you, uh, which would be an interesting turn of events. If it were to go the other way and in favor of LinkedIn, it could cause problems for search engines. It could allow newspaper organizations, for instance, to say, aha, just because we publish a story doesn't mean you get to index it, Google. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's, there's all kinds of precedents that are going to fall out of this no matter how it ends up. Well, folks, there are two kinds of adaptive bitrate for streaming video in this world. Okay, there's more than that, but we're, for our purposes of this <laughs> argument, there's two kinds of adaptive bitrate for streaming video in this world. The kind that measures your network speed from your device and picks a resolution for you, and the kind that tries to keep a sufficient buffer ahead of playback. Now, both of these have issues that you're probably very familiar with. The rate-based model doesn't deal with network speed fluctuations. That's when everything gets all pixely and you can't see it anymore. The buffer-based one doesn't handle skipping around in the video very well and occasionally buffers, right? And you get the spinning wheel. An algorithm developed at MIT called Pen Pensieve uses machine learning on a neural network to switch between the two models and add details from the server delivery side, giving you the best of both worlds. System can even be adjusted to prefer buffering or resolution, depending on your preference. In tests, Pensieve delivered 10 to 25% quality of experience improvement with 10 to 30% less buffering. Uh, big thanks to Andy Beach, who helped me understand this one. His point to me was, server side hasn't done anything usually server side of video streaming is dumb it just sends the bits it's all happened on the client side before and what's interesting is this this is putting some things on the server side feels like kind of a predictive kind of well the thing is it's machine learning which they put a lots of exam i you know uh, uh simplifying it a lot they put a lot of examples in it and out spits the machine you should do it like this but we don't really understand necessarily, don't always understand how or why. And uh, I mean, here it doesn't necessarily matter all that much, but uh, they just, the machine figures out, now you're gonna be using that kind of, uh, um, that kind of adaptive bitrate thing. And now you're yeah. gonna be using the other one. Why? Doesn't matter, just do yeah. it. It improves the video stream. And and it's basically, I mean, if you wanna oversimplify it, you break it down into, if 
if if something's going to cause buffering, you switch to the rate-based one. If the rate-based one's going to get all pixelated, switch back to the buffering. And knowing the conditions well enough to do it in advance so that the video stays nice and smooth. Yeah, I'm sure Netflix is going to be all over that. And YouTube as well, probably. Yeah, or Akamai, those kinds of CDNs, definitely, yeah. Web hosting company DreamHost has filed an opposition to a warrant requesting IP addresses for, of everyone who ever accessed a site that organized a protest at the U.S. presidential inauguration last January. The warrant also seeks content of all, question, of all questions and comment forms filled out by any visitor to the site. The U.S. Department of Justice has filed a motion to compel DreamHost to respond. DreamHost says it has been cooperating on sub subpoenas for individual records in support of the Department of Justice uh, court case, but claims this most recent warrant was overbroad. Yeah, so two interesting things about this. One is it's not a case of not getting a warrant and saying, hey, you don't have a warrant, I'm not handing things over. In fact, they were, they were cooperating with subpoenas. It's saying, yeah, you've got a warrant, but we don't believe this warrant is valid because you're asking for everything we have uh, and you don't need everything we have. That's called, that's the classic definition of a fishing expedition. Yeah, it's it's very clearly, I mean, it sounds like it's clearly, an, uh, you know, overreach, overbroad, how, however you want to call it, which should render this kind of thing invalid if it actually is. Um, looking at it from, without knowing all of the details of all of it, it really does seem like it's overreaching. Uh, I mean, asking not just for the information of everyone who has ever visited the site, but on top of that, which already that that would seem to be overbroad, but on top of that, getting all the questions and comment forms from anyone who ever did any, there needs to be, I mean, uh, this is more of a judicial question, but there needs to be uh, a, a reason for why you're uh, asking for these kinds of uh, pieces of information. The, the reason is, you know, we're going after a criminal and we don't, we know they were on the site. We can show evidence of that, but we don't know what their username was on the site, but we can identify them by their behavior and the things they wrote on the comment forms. But to find that and discover the username, we need to see all the comment forms to search through them. Right. I think this kind of explanation can sound reasonable, but you can use that to justify any request for any information anywhere. Well, and, and this that's is why we have problematic. This is why we have a judicial system. The judge heard that and said that sounds reasonable, I'll grant the warrant. That's the way it's supposed to work because if a warrant does get a little overbroad because of a misunderstanding, the sir the person it's served upon has the right to challenge it. And that's what DreamHost is doing. Nobody's nobody is acting illegally here. Uh, what's happening is the Department of Justice is going after a court, going after a case, and saying we would like this information. Convinced a judge to issue a warrant, and DreamHost gets to say, "Oh, I think you missed something in that warrant. You don't need all 1.3 million IP addresses of everybody who's ever visited the site. I think we could narrow this down by time, uh, by type of user, by you know maybe some geolocation of the IP addresses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera." unless you really are going on a fishing expedition, in which case that's not okay. Right. Makes sense. Yeah. Uh, finally, TechCrunch reports that India's EM3 Agri-Services is letting farmers rent out idle equipment, things like harvesters, tractors, uh, even, even uh, you know, parts and machinery that you add on to harvesters and tractors. This can help small farmers afford to use equipment they couldn't afford otherwise, uh, or make a farmer not have to take a risky loan that could bankrupt them uh, to just get the equipment they need to make farms. F farms are very small in India. They, ha they have a, a larger number of farmers on small holdings in India, uh, well, well above the United States. Company does have an app, but because it's dealing with such small farmers, it also operates using the phone uh, because a lot of these farmers don't have smartphones. So it's Uber for farmers who don't have smartphones. <laughs> because it's using technology. It's using technology on their end to to match make, uh, but not everybody in the system has to have an app or a phone. Yeah, it's really fascinating. It's one of the more, for us, I guess, more surprising um, applications of the concept of Uber or Airbnb. Um, just not only for farm equipment, but also via phone. That's a, that's a surprising one. 
Yeah, by telephone, not smartphone. Uh, EM3 says it has worked with 8,000 farms so far and has partnered with the government of the state of Rajasthan, which is one of the, the big agricultural states, maybe the biggest agricultural state in India. So I, I, I love this story because I love stories where we take a system that we think of only for one thing, like ride hailing, and apply it to something else in a way that's really going to help. It's, it, this is this is going to make things possible for farmers in India that were not possible. Hopefully. Yeah. Uh, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. You can also get the Daily Tech Headlines as an Amazon Echo Flash briefing. And you can get it on the Google Home through the Anchor service, which you can also get it on the Anchor app at anchor.fm. And that's a look at our top stories. Now... Abide with us for a moment, if you will, and think back to an earlier time before the web, before the dark times, <laughs> when when you here in the United States had to have a CompuServe account or an AOL account, maybe, or, or something like Gee, that. Prodigy. Yeah, Prodigy. And you wanted to chat with somebody, you wanted to shop, you wanted to check stock prices. That's what you had to do unless you were in France. France in the <laughs> 80s was a wonderland of information sharing because of something called Minitel. Uh, Patrick, uh, you you lived, you grew up with Minitel. Yeah, basically. Um, we, you know, it's funny. I, I was convinced that most people knew about the Minitel because it was such a, a big deal in the tech world and so innovative. Um, and I was doing a show with uh, Alison Sheridan uh, last week and I think she hadn't heard about the Minitel at all so I figured maybe your audience would be interested in, in hearing about it. Um, basically what it was was a, uh, a full telecommunications package that you could get from essentially the government um, and I think that's a really interesting aspect of it as well. It was completely government, a, a, a government initiative via the uh, post and telecommunications uh, monopolistic company. Um, so you would get this all-in-one box, which included the screen, the foldable uh, 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 keyboard, which would fold up to the, the screen, um, and the modem included in the box, of course. You would plug it into your uh, power outlet and uh, telephone um, outlet. How, I don't know how you call those uh, T-shaped things. Uh, anyway, so the old ones that we had in France, I think they were different for for you guys. But anyway, and you would you would connect it like this, turn it on, and then dial up a service on a, a price structure. So you would connect to, there were, you know, a number of different numbers. It would be 3611 for the free one, 3612, 3613, and up to 3617, uh, which would, could go up to like, I think a, a, up to a couple of dollars a minute. It was really expensive, uh, the higher tiers. Um, but the really interesting thing was that uh, it was a, a, a type of service that anyone could develop and, you know, they would need to get not a license, but uh, work with the telecom company to, um, to, to get it on the network. But it's not like AOL or Prodigy or anything like that, because it wasn't all centralized. You would uh, dial into the, the, the price uh, uh, number, I guess, and then you would type the name of the service you wanted to access and you would go to their servers. I don't know exactly how it worked uh, on the, the back end, but it, it was anyone could develop a service for this thing. So it, it was, was very internet like. Yeah, exactly. Without That's being that. part of the internet. It was absolutely not part of the internet. It was completely closed. Well, I mean, closed within its own system. Um, but it, I, I'm not sure how well it could have worked on the internet. It was so far before the, the you know, the large public had access to the internet. Uh, it was. It started. I would say, eighty five, eighty six. It was like widespread. Yeah. A lot of people had it. It, it, had it was. The, it was launched as a test in Brittany in nineteen seventy eight, and then went France wide in nineteen eighty two. But yeah, you're right. It right. didn't. It didn't. Wasn't like in nineteen eighty two. Suddenly, everybody had it. Uh, but the machines were free. 
I think that was one of the keys yeah. to this taking off because they tried it in Ireland later and in Ireland it didn't catch on because you had to buy the thing. Yeah, they were free. I mean, you would pay for it 10 times over through the, the, the different services you can use, obviously. Uh, but it was also very cleverly designed. I think the design part of it, I, I touched on it uh, uh, just now, but it was really an all-in-one box. And it was the size of a small box. So it wouldn't take up, you wouldn't even really need a desk. You would put it by the, the, the telephone. Um, and most people were thinking about it as something you would use for a couple of minutes to get the information you needed. Obviously, as, as time went on, uh, the, the users developed in different ways. Um, but it was one small box, the foldable uh, keyboard. I don't know if I'm explaining it right, but basically it was a very a solid keyboard. Like the keys were solid plastic, uh, very chunky, and you would fold it up up to the screen so that it would basically close the box. Um, and so that made it super easy to disseminate. You would just go get it as you would go get a telephone. Uh, it was just as easy to use, almost as easy to use. Well, and, and the idea originated uh, with a 1978 report to President Valéry Giscard de d'Estaing. You just say it. Almost. Valéry Giscard d'Estaing. Uh, titled The Computerization of Society, Government Researchers, Simon Nora and Alain Manck argued that the solution to France's telecom woes lay in telematics, and so they decided to replace the phone book. You wouldn't get the white pages anymore. You'd get this thing instead, uh, which saved on printing costs, and then you would look up the numbers in this pretty good search engine, as I understand it, but it took off from there. You could do you could do train tickets. You could do stock prices. You could do mail. You could do chat. You could do shopping. This sounds like the internet to me, but it's not the internet. It's a, it's a sep it's its own internet. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, the, the, I think one of the you mentioned it. One of the interesting thing is that it was really top down. Um, as some of the you know political differences uh, uh, we often talk about between. France, Europe, and, and the US and other countries, this was really a, a government-led operation, which was very successful. I'm not saying this to, you know, make it sound like, oh, it was the government. I, 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 quite the opposite. It was very successful uh, in its time. And yeah, you could do, you could do the phone book thing was, was the very obvious first use, and that was free. Uh, then you had different messaging systems. Then you had some kind of different kinds of shopping. But the one that really took off was chatting. Um, and uh, chatting became incredibly popular, incredibly expensive. Kids like me, because remember, you would have the different price structures, but most of them, well, all of them, you would pay per minute. So it was more or less expensive, even if it's, you know, 10 cents per minute, when you're spending two, three, four, five hours, and it wasn't just 10 cents, by the way, it was a, a lot more usually. If you had access to the, the cheaper access to the thing with a password and everything, you would pay less, but usually you would pay more. And if you do that five hours a day, as some kids might have been known to do, um, the, the phone bill racks up. And the chat was awesome, and I think that was the most internet-like uh, experience of all of it, because it was gathering communities with similar interests from all over the country that you wouldn't necessarily have been able to interact with uh, physically because you were too far away, um, and or maybe you didn't have people who enjoyed the same kind of things as you did in your vicinity, and you would gather in those chat rooms and, and talk about stuff. There were other kinds of chat rooms too, weren't there? <laughs> <laughs> well, obviously, when you're talking about a new kind of communications medium, you're going to have... Uh, porn that is going to be quite popular. Um, it's not a kind of internet if you don't have that. <laughs> if you don't have porn. There were, I mean, I think most people will still remember uh, the 3615 ULA service, which was 3615 ULA. For some reason, the name uh, ULA was evocative of some kind of eroticized uh, something. And, uh, and everyone knew it. And I, I don't think I went on that one. I don't honestly don't remember if that I used porn so much. I was so geeky that I would go to, you know, anime <laughs> websites and uh, not websites, but chat rooms and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it was super successful, successful and, and it made a lot of money. And the Minitel continued. There wasn't so much piracy, of course, because, uh, you know, it was so you could slow. could really copy files, yeah. Exactly. It was like, it would take... 
I would say maybe three seconds to display one page, uh, and the screen was tiny, and it was just you know text. Well, so one one small. rating I read was a downlink of twelve hundred bits per second, not kilobits, <laughs> not megabits, bits, bits per second. Yeah. yeah. And remember, this was the the early eighties when it started, so obviously it's not going to be very fast. Um, but it kept going, and it was so uh, successful and so uh, um, uh, monetarily successful for some of those services. There were a number of models that came out afterwards, one that had color, which was amazing. Um, and, and, and it kept going until I think it shut down in like 2012. June 30th, 2012. Yeah. Isn't that yeah. crazy? It's insane. And obviously, it wasn't very used by then. Um, you always have some people who don't want to get on with the new thing. But it, I, th I think it was used until the like regularly by a significant amount of people, probably until the, the late 90s, early 2000s. Yeah, I, I think I read that in 2009, they first discussed shutting it down and they put it off because they got enough people who are still using it. Uh, and then I think it dwindled enough by 2012, some less than a million at that point. Uh, so they decided to, to get rid of it. Yeah, I think by then it's the kind of, of uses that until if you never take it away, they're never going to go away, right? But well, and a lot do, of the uses were through the it. web. There was a web interface in the later days, right? Yeah, yeah, it was. I mean, they, they and I really want to, you know, I really want to emphasize how cool and ahead of its time this thing was because a lot of people compare it to, you know, AOL and this and that. I think AOL, it was a little bit later wasn't it? Yeah, was much later than 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 uh, 1978, I, I, right. for sure. Yeah, and CompuServe is can... roughly equivalent to it, I think. Exactly. I think you know BBS is CompuServe, that kind mm -hmm. of thing. But yeah. those, I'm pretty sure, were very geeky. You know, you had to know your stuff to to go on CompuServe and to to go to BBSs. That was used by a large portion of the population. Um, so I think well, that that was. Really cool. I, I think this is really interesting because. That 1978 report was in response to France lagging behind in technology. And the government stepped in and said, great, we're going to leapfrog forward. Uh, and we're going to give our populace these machines to make sure it's uptake. And that was that was the benefit. The benefit of having the government involved was you jump-started this thing and leaped in front of everyone else. The problem was it didn't <laughs> adapt very well because it was government-backed and run. And there was some weird stuff about, like... I didn't quite understand, but you had to technically be a newspaper to start a service, and then you could start services to other people, and people started starting newspapers just so they could start Minitel services, and <laughs> there were confusing regulations, put it that way. Uh, and and that may be one of the reasons that it eventually dwindled rather than, than you know, turning into the web or turning into a, an well, internet. I think it served its purpose, mm -hmm. you know? It, it was more, yes, there were regulations, as there always are uh, in France, and I'm sure in many countries, but I think it really served its purpose. It was what it, the, the time needed to be uh, at that point, and it, it uh, uh, opened a lot of people's uh, eyes and, and understandings to what uh, computer, uh, online computer services could be. And I think the internet gained ground really quickly in France, I mean, it gained ground quickly everywhere, but there were a lot of people interested in the internet, partly because of this. Um, I remember, I, I first, I mean, it was because of university, but I, I often uh, tell you that I first started getting into the internet at, in 93, 92, 93, and I, I could wait until I would get it at home, and it developed pretty quickly in the early uh, early 90s, which, I, you know, might have been the case in, in the U.S. because that's where it originated, but I'm not sure it was as uh, quick to develop in other European countries, for example. And, and I think there's something instructive when looking at Indian, particularly African countries, uh, who are dealing with that leapfrog situation of their own, uh, not having the widespread landline, uh, both internet and telephony, and, and, and jumping to smartphones. You know, there may be, the, the next Minitel may be, happening right now in those countries. Listen, I'm sure we have a lot of Minitels left somewhere in a warehouse. I, let's just send them to Africa and those countries that need the technology and they'll be happy. Right? Bunch of Raspberry Pis and a Minitel, here, go. We're yeah, gonna there's... give you a bunch of uh, terminals that are about 
as powerful as one app on your smartphone. <laughs> not even, not even at all. Uh, but there's, you know, there's a lot of uh, nostalgia, not nostalgia, but like fun uh, imagery of the Minitel. And there's uh, even a project that I found about, uh, I found out about um, looking for, for details for this episode. And it's a school um, that managed to retrofit the Minitel uh, to surf the web. To actually serve the actual web now, of course, you know it's it's they're cheating. They're using a Raspberry Pi to do the actual computing, um, but they're using using the screen and the um, screen and the, the keyboard, like the old school screen and the yeah. keyboard. Um, it wasn't a QWERTY keyboard either, was it? Oh well, it was no, it was a weird keyboard. I mean, it was Azerty, which is what we use in France, uh, but it was weird. It had like all kind of special. Uh, 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 special keys and it was yeah no it was it was a weird stuff there, there were uh like kind of again to make it simple and usable there were kind of function keys uh like five of them that did one thing uh, and then you had the key it was like yeah. to, to try and do special functions for the inevitable uh uh hidden functions that people would develop on the chat rooms and these kind of things it was like you had secret strings and it was a fun time well, thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit. It's where we get a lot of our ideas about what to talk about. Uh, submit stories and vote on them. You might be the next Minitel story submission <laughs> at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. And, of course, on our Facebook group, facebook.com slash groups slash dailytechnewsshow. Real quick before we're out of here, I want to read this email from Scott in the high desert who said, I've been wondering about using electric vehicles to load balance for a while. I've also been interested in using them in lieu of generators during power outages. I moved to an old farmhouse last fall, which the previous owner had wired for a backup generator. Out in the country, electricity seems much more important. My well pump doesn't work without it. This past winter was the first I've ever been extremely concerned about power outages affecting our heat and water availability. Having an electric vehicle that I could use as a backup power for my home in a pinch would be another selling point. I also began thinking a PTO generator for our small tractor would be useful, but a small electric tractor that could be used to balance electricity would be even better. In my case, it's parked 98% of the time. Weight is actually helpful. And when using a loader, and it could double as a drivable generator if I needed to operate an electric saw or other tools while out working away from a wired power source. I also think about the maintenance a tractor requires, checking fluids, worrying about pressure and heat, etc. Below are a couple links to John Deere's electric tractor and a review of an electric riding mower. Maintenance is so much less on these devices. Oil the wheel bearings, but I think the blades run, are run by motors. No belt, no topping off or changing my lawnmower oil or filling gas. I look forward to the electric revolution. We'll have those links in the show notes at dailytechnewsshow.com. But yeah, uh, kind of hits home that idea of using an electric car as a backup generator, right there, uh, Patrick? L listen, we just uh, mentioned the fact a few minutes ago that I was in the country house right now. And I, I, I'm I, starting to worry about these kinds of things as well. You don't worry about them when you're living in the city, but when you have one power line and it can go out and it actually does sometimes, and you have to work from this country house, uh, you're worried about these things. It would make it, I mean, electric vehicles are still very expensive. So I think it wouldn't push people to those purchases just for that uh, because it's still way too expensive. But if uh, you're, you, you either you have more of a financial incentive to do it because of your work uh, or they're cheaper, yes, I want that kind of thing to be possible. Listen, uh, if you need to tell your wife that we decided on DTNS that it would be best for you to buy a Tesla, then <laughs> you know you can you can cite this email as, as your I, um, reason for that. You know, the Model Three is looking pretty sexy right now. It's necessary. It's it it's, yeah. could save your lives. If listen, if I can uh, invoice uh, two thirds of it <laughs> to DTNS, <laughs> let's say a three fourth. Um, maybe that's doable. I think we might need a milestone for that. Okay. Um, all right. Well, yeah. let's think about it. All right. Uh, thank you, Patrick Beja, as always. Of course, you can find all the great stuff Patrick does at Frenchspin.com or Frenchspin.fr, depending on which language you want to listen to it in. Uh, what you got going on there these days? Um, I'll, I'll talk about the latest special we did on the Phineas Club. Um, we had uh, Mayank on, and he's from India, and he talks about India for about an hour and a little bit and telling us how it was for him growing up in India uh, 
when, in the 80s and how India changed over the, the 80s, 90s, and even more recently. Uh, that was a super interesting one. So if you're if you like that kind of uh, discussion, then hand, uh, head over to frenchspin.com and listen to the latest episode of the Phidias Club. I highly recommend it. Also want to thank everybody who supports this show directly. If you are a patron at any level, uh, there is a specific RSS feed that includes the full pre and post show as an audio file, not just the main show. Uh, for instance, on the pre-show today, Patrick was asking us about mesh networks. Uh, so Roger and I were try discussing mesh networks with Patrick uh, for a good little while. And if you're interested in that, go check that out. If you're not a patron yet and you'd like to get stuff like that, be sure to go to patreon.com slash DTNS. You only have to give a dollar a month. That's the minimum. That's like five cents a show. So if the show is worth five cents to you, head to patreon.com slash DTNS. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC at alphageekradio.com and diamondclub.tv. Our website is dailytechnewsshow.com and we'll be back tomorrow with Mr. Scott Johnson. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> good show. What should we call it? Yeah, it was fun. That was good. You're incompetent. <laughs> um, Wait, what? Wait, are you just saying that like you normally do, or is that a title suggestion? Pick your pick. <laughs> no, that's the. Uh, it's one of the um, top... Uh, the Internet of bricks is pretty. Internet of bricks. <laughs> Ow, that's a brick. <laughs> Battle.net is dead. Long live Battle.net. Sorry, my neighbors mowing their lawn. Uh, brick to unlock. E I E I Uber. Something in French. Je suis ne prêt. Future sucks. Miss Smart House is bricked. Lock, lock. Patrick Minitel's all. Ha ha ha. Ah. Nice. Minute, tell me about it. <laughs> uh, like DTNS buys Patrick a Tesla. Tom's LinkedIn theory. <laughs> Wait minute, a minute. Tell, tell me about it. <laughs> I, I I think Dark Redeemer has it. Do you like that one? That one definitely got <laughs> you. I, I could I tell. That doesn't happen often. <laughs> Did he tell me about it? <laughs> I, I the the temporary title I usually just put with whoever's on. Uh, this time I put Patrick Minna tells us a story. Oh, well, great minds. Which my neighbors had electric leaf blowers and lawn mowers. I don't know. There's a thing about like the for me it sounds very like I could hear a, a New Jersey accent or something yeah. about tell me about it and with Minna tell. Minna, tell me about it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I don't know. Any others in there, Roger, that caught your eye? I kind of think we're, we've decided, but... I think, uh, that's, for me, that was a pretty good one. Especially since it ties in with the main discussion. Pensive is pensive. Oh, there's one from Ken who says, I shall call it Minitel. I shall call it. <laughs> that's good, too. Wow, that's really... <laughs> You're really into the mini tail puns yeah. today. Listen, it's it's evocative of of um, Austin, of Powers. Austin Powers. So, yeah, and that's always well, okay. All right, I can I can see I can see uh, uh, what's his face. Oh, Mike, Mike Myers. Mike Myers. No, but like the evil Doctor. Oh, evil. right, the, the character. Evil. Yeah. I call him Mini Mini Tail. <laughs> see, it's the evil mini phone mini company. Yeah. Looking at it saying, yeah. What was Telex? Minitel was different than Telex, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Telex. Okay. Oh, you didn't have Telex? No, we didn't. I mean, I oh, think really? we had a version of it, but so it basically wasn't very much. Telex Telex was it was popular around Europe, I'm pretty sure. Uh it was a typewriter uh connected to another it was uh -huh, like faxes except for typewriters. Yeah. So you would connect to one another, and what you would type would be transmitted to the other one. Right. So you couldn't, like, copy an image, but no. whatever you typed showed up on the other. Whatever. Right. It was basically a chat, one-to-one -one chat. It gotcha. was SMS, but with <laughs> typewriters. 
Well, because I the first time I ran into Telex was 1996 when I visited London for the first time, and the hotel we stayed at had a Telex thing on its business card, and I'm like, what the hell is that? No, I think by that time though in the U.S., I remember my mom seeing one in my mom's at the Wells Fargo Bank, but that's like back when banks had to deal with uh, um, yeah international thing. It was but definitely a specialty thing in the U.S. It was not something I, you said you had at well, hotels. The, the fax came so quickly, and and it did such a good job at having people not having to type. Right, you just handwrite a yeah. note. Um, I mean, honestly, the telex was kind of dumb. Uh, it, <laughs> it was kind of stupid. It feels um, like a Harry Potter thing now. Like you type I mean, on one yeah. end, and then the typewriter on the other end types well, the I same. Mean, thing. I think the there might have been around been forever. Though it was kind of an outgrowth of the telegraph, right? If you could just send yeah. Morse code, why couldn't you send a keystroke? Right, yeah. right, right. Because yeah. there I was, I think there might have been ways of storing, like sending an entire string or like a page, even somehow recording it. I don't remember. We had one at home for Dad's work. Oh, but, no kidding! Uh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, fancy. We, we did, yeah, uh, but I don't remember it because if it's just typing real time, then you can just pick up the phone. I mean, come on. Um, so is don't. it uh, mini tell me about it? Is that what we're sticking yes. with? Okay. <laughs> I'm finalizing that now. So. Mini tell me uh, about it. Mini tell like me a mini tell me a story, Patrick. So, it's uh, the story of a little ant <laughs> that goes up against an elephant. That's a big and, version of an ant, right? An elephant? No. Or is like it an, an elf elephant. That's Why are you trying to ruin the story, Tom? <laughs> Shut up and let me tell the story. So <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I won't. There you go. No, you I'm won. sorry. Tell me the story. Uh, this does mean, yes, Zoe Brings Bacon asks, does this mean DTNS won't buy Patrick a Tesla? That is correct. <laughs> what? I'm sorry, but we will not be buying Patrick a Tesla. Yet, right. yet, right? Never okay. say never. Thank you. Thank you for that. I mean, if the Patreon goes to a million dollars a month, we'll see. Or, or listen, if it goes to a hundred thousand a month, I think you can afford one <laughs> Tesla for Patrick. afford the payments. <laughs> well, but then if you want it, then Justin's gonna want one, then Scott's gonna want one, then Veronica's gonna we want won't another. Tell them. One. We won't tell them. They don't listen to the Patreon feed anyway. They won't know. <laughs> But they're going to find out because they're going to see all your Instagrams of you and your hot new Tesla. Oh, I'll, I'll just pretend I, I bought it my, my Social phone. media blackout. <laughs> TextJeb says up until the early 90s, police departments communicated through teletype, which is a, teletype, a telex kind of. Oh, yeah. I was going to say it sounds yeah. like telex. Yeah. TextJeb also accidentally rickrolled me. <laughs> on the Amazon Echo yesterday. What? <laughs> Which was hilarious. He's, he meant to send it to somebody else. Uh, and we are connected. Uh, and so I all of a sudden I get a message on my Echo and I'm like, oh, play the message. And and the, the Amazon Echo voice starts to say, you are no stranger to love. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> Made me laugh. The best Rickroll I've I've had in a long time. Isn't it funny that Rickroll's still kind of a thing that's kind of just worked its way into our extended culture? Yeah, it feels like it's it can never it can never really go away. Like some people yeah. will not really understand it at some point, but you can go and like it cool. will it will become cool at some point. Like the word cool was mm. was like jargon that was made up in the sixties. I want to say maybe fifties. Is it that recent? Yeah, and then it and then it it yeah, didn't go away. Lots yeah. of other things like groovy yeah. did go away. Tubular, <laughs> yeah, and tubular. <laughs> I feel like Rickroll yeah. has cemented itself. It's, it's, yeah, it's it because it's it's it describes a certain type of joke, like or prank, practical, mm -hmm. almost a practical internet like age practical joke. So you can use it for a lot of things. And it's harmless, right? There's no, there's nothing bad about that Rick Astley song. I mean, you could say it's not a great <laughs> song. It's a bad song, but there's nothing harmful, yeah. I should say, about the song. Um, well, it's just funny. Yeah. 
it's kind of harmful to <laughs> to your ears. <laughs> You're no stranger to love. You know the rules. No, so I'm, I. Not. I'm not. <laughs> That's so hot fish. Dark Redeemer says we should replace cool with hot fish. Because Dark mm. Redeemer watched Rick and Morty on Adult Swim, yeah. is my guess, because that's where I saw that. I don't watch Rick and Morty, much to the chagrin of many internet people. Ah, uh, you don't Philistine. have Philistine. It's a good show. I watched one, and I think all the puking put me off. Does he puke all the time? Like in no, all the not all the yeah. time. Most of the time, but not all the time. He's okay. probably above yeah. average in the number of times. Above average puking. Yeah. I don't is know. That, it put is me that off. a sensitive it point good. for you? No, but it, it felt like gross, like not in a good way. It felt like, I don't know, not just the puking, like the whole thing felt like juvenile, just a lot of gross humor. I don't necessarily have a problem with juvenile. I don't think for, if, for, for some reason, it didn't. <laughs> as long as it's mature well. juvenile. <laughs> <laughs> I prefer no, I mean, refined. Yeah. I prefer a very adult, mature, refined juvenile. <laughs> Like Le Stuge Toi. <laughs> yeah, yeah, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Three Stooges? Three Stooges. Oh. <laughs> you know that so, French. So that, that I don't know at all. That's I never a... liked the Three Stooges growing up. I developed a, a better appreciation for them later, but it's not my type of humor. Yeah, not just... a slapstick fan. No, I did like uh, Abbott and Costello, though. Oh, yeah, I did. I liked them. You're but I wasn't a well. fan of uh, Laurel and Hardy. I like them all fun. right. I preferred Abbott and Costello. Though. I think it's because Abbott and Costello did more wordplay and Laurel mm-hmm. and Hardy was a little more slapstick. Yep. Do you Who's like slapstick, first? Patrick? Not for me. See, I think, that, I think that's part of the, uh, the issue here. But is Rick and Morty slapstick? Really? It's got elements of slapstick to it. Yeah. Yeah. But it's not... I, I wouldn't call it slapstick, but I'd call it funny. I assume you love Everyone. Jerry Lewis. Obviously. <laughs> Am I French is the answer to that question. Yes. So clearly, <laughs> I mean, if you were German, I would assume you love David Hasselhoff in the same way. So. Well, interesting. Yeah, That's generational. Though. What's that? Liking being German and liking David Hasselhoff is very generational. But I think Patrick just admitted to being German. No, I admitted to liking David Hasselhoff. That I makes you German. like him because he was in Knight Rider. That's the law. Yeah, Knight Rider. Um, but no, I think Germans loving David Hasselhoff doesn't mean you're German if you love David Hasselhoff. If you like Jerry Lewis, you're French. It's the law. No. That is Wait. the law. That is, as I understand it, the law of citizenship. Really? Just no, I mean, type Americans have a you don't think any Americans love Jerry Lewis? <laughs> if they do. They're French. They're oh, dual okay. citizens. All right. <laughs> All right. That, well, now you're making sense. <laughs> Did you hear about the guy who is New Zealand? Is a, he's a New Zealander because the New Zealand laws say that if you're, one of your parents is a native New Zealander, that makes you a New Zealander. And the Australian laws say you can't be a member of the Senate if you are a, a citizen of a, some, a country outside of Australia. And so through no fault of his own, now he's caught up into this controversy. He's not a very likable guy, I just want to say. But he didn't choose to have his dad be New Zealander. Uh, well, I mean, the thing to understand with that is it's been going on for like a month. No, no, I know. But it's, it is a kind of a hilarious situation where it's like, really? Like if your dad's from another country or your mom in Australia, you can't be in the Senate. It's the way the... No, you can't be a dual citizen. And uh, is I'm sure he could renounce his citizenship. He would, well, he didn't because he didn't realize he, he didn't had. know. Yeah. Right, but at some point he could like now renounce it and then yeah. But he was already So elected. much so so many things have gone in since then. The two greens, uh the two green senators. Yeah. They had to go because one of them was Canadian, had Canadian citizen, citizenship and the other one had But didn't she have like avowedly got Canadian citizenship. Not it wasn't this yeah. accidental thing, right? No, she was just born there. Her parents, she she was. Born oh, okay. In Canada, but her, her parents are Australian. So it was the same thing where she never renounced her citizenship. Yeah, well, it's like here. Well, that's like Mitt of, Romney being Mexican. Yeah, or it's like Ted Cruz being Canadian, right? Yeah, because yeah. He was born there. 
Very few. It's kind of interesting. Once you think about it, there are very few countries. Wait, Mexican except, or Brazilian? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, no, I think he was Mexican. But mm -hmm. um, born in Mexico. Like most countries in the Western Hemisphere have some sort of birthright citizenship where you're if you're born in the country you're automatic citizen. well i know there's countries that say if your parent was born in this country you can apply and get a passport well but it doesn't automatically grant you the citizenship in those cases whereas new zealand was like no you're until, you're a citizen i think in france until very recently like five or ten years ago that was the case as well if you were either born in the country or um yeah, or of, I think maybe if your parents are, you get it anyway, whether or not you're... You but there's a difference between being able to get it and ha having it no, thrust you upon you. Yeah, so you're saying it was that. It was the same yeah. thing. Yeah, That's interesting. So. Mm -hmm. And it, w it was protective for well, the citizens. But, I was uh, born down in a dead man's town. Where are you now? First kick That's I took was before I hit the ground because I was born in the USA. Uh, very interesting that song yeah it's actually not what you think when you yeah, exactly and song. it's being used it, as yeah, exactly. what you think yeah. um, all right i'm gonna go all okay. right thank you patrick thank uh you much, we are gentlemen. published now too thank you everybody for watching have a lovely day